Thank you all for coming today. We have a very special guest. And to give a welcome to the college, our Dean Patricia Ireland. Good afternoon. Um, my job is to welcome Dr. Godsey to our beautiful campus here on Sebago Lake. I hope you have a, a chance to walk around a little bit. But on behalf of the president, uh, Dr. Jim DeLugos, and our chief learning officer, Dr. Michael Pardalis, I welcome you to our college, I, and um, we're so thankful that you're here to share your insights and uh, that our students and our faculty can gain some um, new knowledge. Thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Conley, who will formally introduce our speaker. I'll be very brief. It's good to see that full professors can get lost on the way to St. Joseph's <laughs> College. I know I did my first time on the same route. Um, I don't know how I first heard of uh, Kristen Godsey. It was on the internet. And I was impressed with her long list of publications. And then I noticed that she was at Bowdoin, so just a, a few miles from here. And uh, so the Cultural Affairs Committee said, well, here's a golden opportunity. And then we found out not only is she on a one-year leave, but a two-year leave from Bowdoin. And so I hope you can stay a little while afterwards and talk to our faculty about how do you go about getting a two-year leave. Uh, but in any case, uh, Kristen Godsey is a graduate of uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, master's and PhD at University of California, Berkeley. Is it true that you're a banana slug? I am a banana slug. <laughs> That's the mascot for the University of California at Santa Cruz, the, the <laughs> banana slugs. She's been at Bowdoin since uh, 2002. She specializes in uh, women's studies, gender studies, uh, studies of Southeast uh, Europe, and especially the impact in, uh, of transition and the transition progress on the part of ordinary men and women. So she's the author of six books. I'll just uh, mention them briefly and then turn it over to her. Uh, and I found them all very, very interesting. I mean, such an array of, of subjects. Uh, first of all, with a fellow Connolly, Rachel Connolly, she authored uh, Professor Mummy, Finding Work, Family Balance in Academia. Uh, the Red Riviera, Gender Tourism and Post-Socialism on the Black Sea, Muslim Lives in Eastern Europe, Lost in Transition, Ethnographies of Everyday Life After Communism, The Left Side of History, World War II and the Unfulfilled Promise of Communism in Eastern Europe, and finally, due out uh, next year, okay. uh, Notes from Notes to Narrative, Writing Ethnographies that Everyone Can Read. So from the esoteric to the practical, and a very warm welcome to you, Kristen Godsey. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can everybody hear me? I hope this is pretty clear. So I just want to apologize for getting lost. Um, I spent all of last year on sabbatical in Germany where I didn't have a car, um, and I haven't been driving. And I returned from Australia a week ago yesterday. Um, so I'm still dealing with 15 time zones and a hemisphere's worth of jet lag, as well as not having driven in over 13 or 14 months. So this was my first foray in a car in a while. Um, it's funny. You'd think it'd be like riding a bicycle, but <laughs> it's not quite. So today I'm going to talk about my um, recent book, The Left Side of History. And before I do that, I want you to take a minute and, um, in your mind, mm -hmm. Think of one or two, possibly three people, that you would consider your heroes. It's people that you look up to and admire for, it doesn't matter what reason, but I want you to think about heroes, people that would be considered your personal heroes. So if somebody asked you, who's your hero? Who do you look up to? What would you say? And I want you to keep that in mind for the remainder of my talk. I'm going to come back to it towards the end. Um, but it's an important exercise for us to think about what we mean when we talk about heroes. So The Left Side of History is a book that I sort of wrote by mistake, if that's possible. I was working on a completely different project, and for a variety of serendipitous reasons, I ended up coming across the stories of two individuals who, in a way, um, very late in my life, became my heroes. The first is Frank Thompson, here on the cover. He was a... Um, Oxford student in the 30s who signed up to fight for the British government, for the British during World War II, uh, and died fighting with the Bulgarian partisans against their Nazi allied monarchy. 
The other is Elena Lagodinova, who is a young Bulgarian peasant girl who was 14 years old when she became the youngest female partisan fighting against the Bulgarian allied, sorry, the Nazi allied Bulgarian monarchy in World War II. And both of these people have really incredible stories, which I account, which I recount in the book. So the first story is of Major Frank Thompson, who was 18 years old uh, when he went to Oxford University and 19 years old when he signed up to fight in the British Armed Forces two days before the official declaration of war against um, Germany. So in many ways, Frank Thompson, for the students in the room, was about your age, right? But a very different era, a very different time. Now, what's fascinating about Frank Thompson, he was the son of a very well-known academic, um, uh, somebody who was uh, Oxford-educated, he, his younger brother was the great labor historian Edward Palmer Thompson. Some of you may have heard of him. Um, he was an incredibly brilliant uh, young man who won a fellowship to Winchester College in the United Kingdom where he studied with the great physicist Freeman Dyson, which is one of the reasons why I got to know uh, about Frank Thompson. I got to know him personally through Freeman Dyson when I met Dyson at the Institute for Advanced Study in 2006, 2007. They were classmates. Frank Thompson at Winchester learned six languages. And in addition to his formal study of language, he started an obscure languages club in which he convinced all of the boys in his dormitory to learn um, swear words in very strange languages so they could curse each other um, in front of the uh, professors there <laughs> without getting in trouble. He was a really quite talented young man who went on, uh, this is a picture of his family. His father, again, was an academic he, who was a specialist in India, was friends with Nehru and Gandhi. Um, his younger brother, of course, is E.P. Thompson. And this is a picture of Frank Thompson on the far left. He went to Oxford University in 1938. And uh, he happened upon a very attractive young woman who, with whom he became quite smitten. Her name was Iris Murdoch. Uh, she later went on to be a quite well-known and accomplished philosopher and novelist. Some of you may have heard of her. And Frank Thompson was drinking at a party one night and attempting to flirt with Iris Murdoch. And there was another young man who was trying to flirt with her as well. And Frank Thompson, realizing that he needed to get her attention and that she was interested in politics, decided to speak with her about this current situation in England and the state of the Labour Party. And he was railing against the politics of the Labour Party and Chamberlain and general British politics in general in the lead up to the Second World War. And Iris, Tom uh, Iris Murdoch challenged Frank Thompson and said, why not join the Communist Party? So one of the things that is really truly amazing about Frank Thompson is that even though he died quite young, he was an incredible diarist, an amazing pen pal, and a phenomenal poet. And all of these materials have come down to us. One of the things um, that I found when I was researching Frank Thompson is that some argue that there is no better documentation of the Second World War through the individual letters, diaries, and poems of a single soldier than there is of Frank Thompson, because so much of his material has been preserved. So we know from his diary that after this night, Frank Thompson went home and wrote in his diary, I was dumbstruck. I never thought of it before. Right then, I couldn't see anything against it but felt it would be wise to decide to wait until I'd sobered up before deciding. So I said, come to tea in a couple of days and convert me. Then I staggered home and lay on the sofa, announcing to the world that I had met a stunner of a girl and was joining the Communist Party for love of her. The next morning, but the next morning, it still seemed good. I read State and Revolution, talked to several people, and made up my mind. And so it was in 1938 that Frank Thompson officially joined the Communist Party of Great Britain. When he joined the um, war, British war effort, he enlisted at 19 years old in England, he enlisted a full year before he would have been drafted. So at the time, university students in the United Kingdom did not actually be, they were not called up for service until their 20th birthdays. His parents, his brother, as well as Iris Murdoch were vehemently opposed to his enlistment. 
at the age of 19. And Iris Murdoch, in particular, was opposed because, as you may know, at that moment, um, the Soviet Union was neutral in the Second World War. And uh, the Communist Party of Great Britain, the official line of the party was that this was an imperialist war between imperialist bourgeois Britain and imperialist bourgeois Germany, and communists should have no part of it. So in response to Iris Murdoch, Frank Thompson wrote this poem called Madonna Bolshevika. Sure, lady, I know the party line is better. I know what Marx would have said, I know you're right. When this is over, we'll fight for the things that matter. Somehow today, I simply want to fight. That's heresy? Okay, but I'm past caring. There's blood about my eyes and mist and hate. I know the things we're fighting now and loathe them. Now's not the time, you say, but I can't wait. And so Frank Thompson goes off to fight. Uh, he is trained in Britain. He ends, uh, he ends up in North Africa fighting in the Western Desert. He's transferred to the Middle East for a while uh, where he learns Russian and Polish and Bulgarian and Serbian. Uh, then he, he participates in the Sicilian landings. And after the Sicilian landings, when the tide of the war is beginning to turn, he volunteers for something called the Special Operations Executive, which is a sort of British Secret Service kind of James Bond type operation, whereby the British government was dropping British soldiers, well-trained British officers, behind enemy lines to work with partisan forces in either Nazi-allied or Nazi-occupied countries. Particularly here, we're talking about Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Yugoslavia, and Greece. So prior to his parachuting into Bulgaria in January of 1944, he wrote this letter to Iris Murdoch. And what I love about this letter is the optimism that he sees. He really believes that he's fighting for something better, that after the Second World War, Europe is going to be a better place. And he's meeting all of these people. He was training with Yugoslav partisans in Cairo at the time that he wrote this letter. And he says, there is a spirit abroad in Europe which is finer and braver than anything that tired continent has known for centuries and which cannot be withstood. You can, if you like, think of it in terms of politics, but it is broader and more generous than any dogma. It is the confident will of whole peoples who have known the utmost humiliation and suffering and have triumphed over it to build their own life once and for all. And this was written on Christmas Day of 1943. So Frank Thompson parachutes behind enemy lines into Bulgaria, which at the time is occupied by, well, not occupied, allied with Nazi Germany, and is helping to occupy Serbia, Macedonia, and northern Greece. And he is stationed with a group of Bulgarian partisans, uh, the leader of which, um, of one of the brigades that Thompson is working with, is a man called Denchos Nepolsky. Thompson uh, is hiding in the mountains, running in and out of Bulgaria to do partisan activity, hoping to disrupt Nazi supply lines into Greece. And this is a recollection from Denchos Nepolsky about Thompson and his time serving in Bulgaria with the partisans. He writes, Thompson was very much attached to the people and showed great interest in the peasant life. He showed a happy and kind character, both when he spoke Bulgarian and when he danced Bulgarian national dances. It was difficult to tell he was a foreigner. He got used to everything. He was hungry with the rest of us. He had to fight the second enemy of the partisans, the lice, just as everybody else did. This is what binds people together in the struggle against fascism. This made the Bulgarian partisans and the Bulgarian people feel Thompson close to their hearts. And again, this is from a letter that Thompson wrote to his parents after spending time with the partisans in Bulgaria. He writes, my eyes fill very quickly with tears when I think what a splendid Europe we shall build when all of the vitality and talent of its indomitable peoples can be set free for cooperation and creation. Think only of the Balkans and the beauty, gaiety, and courage with their, which their peoples have preserved throughout the last 600 years, which have brought them little else but poverty, oppression, and fratricide. 
When men like these have mastered their own fates, there won't be time for discussing what is beauty. One will be overwhelmed by the abundance of it. What you can see clearly from these quotes is that not only was Thompson a very, very, very committed and idealistic young man, but he was willing to act on his idealism, and not in a small part because of his commitment to the Communist Party and what it stood for at that time. Now, unfortunately, in May of 1944, the brigade that Frank Thompson was traveling with moved into Bulgaria on orders from the Comintern in Moscow. They were ambushed. Frank Thompson was captured. As a uniformed British officer, he should have been held as a prisoner of war under the terms of the Geneva Convention, of which Bulgaria was a signatory. However, for reasons that still to this day remain unknown, he was tortured um, and beaten and held in a prison cell for about a month before, for no clear reason whatsoever, he was marched out into the forest and shot, his body left in a ditch. Later, after the communists came to power in Bulgaria, his body was exhumed and reburied here. This is the grave in Litakovo. This is a picture that I took a couple of years ago. You can see from the headstone that he's buried with two other named members of the Bulgarian Communist Party. And here it says, and nine unknown people. It's just a collective grave. Now, upon hearing of his brother's death, his younger brother, E.P. Thompson, who was serving at the time in Italy, wrote a letter to his father which, in which he said, Frank was lucky, as I see it, in this one thing above all others, that he had the joy of knowing that whatever happened, his action was contributing to a great good and lasting enrichment of the life of mankind. Many men have died in this war, and I have known a few. Of the many, hardly a handful can have held so much promise as Frank, and I fear that only a few have the certainty which he had, that he was contributing to a great and creative cause, as one among other comrades who, following after, will not fail to build richly on the foundation of his life. However much we may know the world to have lost in Frank's talents and character, there is no question of waste. For he concentrated into his one last action all the promise and achievement of his life. The extent to which he will influence and inspire men, we can never know. He lives in us, and in friends we know, and in men we shall never meet. He is a strong force for the friendship of nations. This is a letter from E.P. Thompson in November of 1944. Now I'm going to switch here to the story of Elena Lagodinova, which I will tell slightly more briefly. As I said, she was a young peasant girl living in the town of Razlog in southwestern Bulgaria near the Macedonian border. She was 11 years old when she became a helper to her three older brothers, who at the time were partisans already fighting in the mountains. At the age of 14, the Bulgarian gendarmerie threw a um, incendiary bomb into her house, and she was basically forced to flee and became a partisan fighting with her brothers in the mountains at the age of 14 in May of 1944, also joined by her father since they didn't have a home to go back to. These are her two older brother, uh, two of her older brothers, Boris and Konstantin Lagodinov. Uh, Kostadin himself has an incredibly fascinating story, which I go into the book, into in the book, but I don't have time to talk about now. He was a communist in the uh, 20s. He was exiled to the Soviet Union. Stalin sent him to Siberia. After he left Siberia, he came back to Bulgaria. Was in a submarine. It's an incredible story, and eventually ends up fighting against the Nazis during World War II with the Partisan Brigade. The middle brother, Asen Lagodinov, was also a communist. He was a very widely known youth leader um, in the region and very much saw himself as a Democrat. I know that may seem contradictory to, to you all, but remember, Bulgaria was not a democracy. It was a monarchy, and he believed that 
um, communism would bring about popular democracy in Bulgaria and ultimately result in something called the Independent Balkan Federation, whereby the states of Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Greece would be independent from the great powers. Um, this is a wonderful picture of the three brothers. They all took to the mountains um, for the entirety of the war, one of the longest lasting partisan brigades in Bulgaria. And of the three brothers, Asen Lagodinov was um, ambushed and captured in, uh, also in June of 1944. And because of the partisan activity in Bulgaria, the Bulgarian government put a bounty on the heads of all of the partisans. And this was quite literally a bounty for the heads of the partisans. So in June of 1944, Asen Lagodinov was decapitated and his head was brought in to the local police station, after which it was mounted on a pike in the middle of the village as a warning to others that they shouldn't join the partisans and fight against the Bulgarian uh, government, which, as I said, at the time was allied with Nazi Germany. This was a very common practice of the Bulgarian gendarmerie, was to take heads and then mount them on sticks and like put them out in the quad you know, so that you could see them. Uh, Here is another wonderful photograph you see here, this is the young, this is, this is immediately after the war. This is Elena Lagodinova at 14 years old. And then these are some of the other partisans in her unit. So in Bulgaria, there is a, um, as the Red Army marches westward, there is a communist uprising. Some would call it a coup d'etat on September 9th, 1944. The monarchy is overthrown and uh, a new communist government led by Georgi Dimitrov, who is the leader of the Comintern in Moscow, comes into power, and it is the partisan brigades that are largely uh, in charge of restoring order to the country. Now, Elena Lagodinova herself, being this young girl, only 14 years old, becomes something, as you can imagine, of a national hero during the communist era. Uh, young children from Belgrade, to St. Petersburg are admonished to be brave like the Amazon. She is uh, celebrated. She eventually goes on to uh, study in Moscow. She earns a PhD in biology. She, she becomes a, a genetic engineer working with uh, the manipulation of wheat seeds. Uh, you can see here, this is a, a book that was written about her. Her code name was the Amazon. This is Amazonkata. Um, which is the story of her time as a partisan. This is a wonderful uh, image from inside of the book, which shows her um, coming down from the mountains on her famous white horse, Belio was the name of the horse, and uh, being celebrated by the partisans liberating Bulgaria from the so-called fascist yoke. She marries a, a fellow partisan, this man here, Marin Stajkov is his name. She eventually has three children, and uh, for 13 years after returning from Moscow, she was working in the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences as a genetic engineer. Uh, as I said, manipulating wheat seeds to create more robust crops. And then in 1967, it is decided that she will become the president of the Bulgarian Women's Committee, which is a committee uh, charged with helping Bulgarian women who, as many of you may or may not know, um, were compelled to work, right? So under communism, women were fully incorporated into the labor force. And in Bulgaria in the late 60s, uh, they noticed that women who were fully incorporated into the labor force didn't have as many children as women who stayed at home. So the Bulgarian government very much wanted to raise the birth, birth rate while at the same time increasing uh, women's participation in the professions. And so her charge as president of this Bulgarian Women's Committee was to try to expand things like maternity leaves, child care centers, um, flexible working arrangements for women, many of the things, in fact, that we are talking about in the United States in 2015. Not only was she domestically empowered to work with women, but Elena Lagodinova was an incredibly charismatic speaker who traveled all around the world working with women's committees in about 160 countries. She had a lot of connections. She was greatly involved in the United Nations Decade for Women and the three conferences that they had in Mexico City in 1975, in Copenhagen in 1980, 
and in Nairobi in 1985. You can see her here. This is with the president of the Ethiopian Women's Committee. This is a wonderful photograph of um, Elena Lagodinova at the podium in 1989. If you look at the date, this is the uh, 12th to the 15th of September. And uh, the name of the conference that she's speaking at is Challenges and Perspectives in a Changing World. Now, for those of you who are old enough to remember the date, about a month later, two months later, I guess, the world would indeed change very dramatically when the Berlin Wall fell in the beginning of December of 1989. And much of the work that she had done for women, not only in Bulgaria, but around the world, was wiped away by a new um, global economic system, which we call neoliberal capitalism. Today in Bulgaria, people like Elena Lagodinova are remembered as red scum. Um, this is a wonderful placard from protests that I happened to attend two years ago. You red scumbags, look at your tracks. You are a disgrace of the human race. Obviously not the greatest of English, but <laughs> you get the idea. Um, this, is a, this is a placard that is aimed at any of the former communist elite in Bulgaria. And uh, here is a picture of Elena Lagodinova, who is still alive today. Uh, she lives cloistered in a very small apartment in Sofia. She's more or less been a recluse for the last 25 years. Um, this was in March of 2013. We went to visit the grave of Georgi Dimitrov, who was the leader of the common term and Bulgaria's first communist prime minister. Um, and so I want to come back to this idea of hero, right? So Frank Thompson was 19, and he died when he was 23. Elena Lagodinova fought in the Second World War when she was 14. I mean, officially she started fighting when she was 11. She wasn't actually fighting, she was helping. But she actually took up arms when she was 14. And she lived a very long life, given that she's obviously still alive today. She's 85 at the, at the moment. Um, and, but, and they both, I would say, um, were very, very committed idealists, people who believed um, that the world could be made a better place by individual activity, by individual right, action. And so as I was thinking about these two people and comparing them in some ways to young people today or the zeitgeist of youth today, I started thinking about the idea of hero. What is a hero? And so whenever I have these existential questions, I tend to go to the Oxford English Dictionary. It's the first place I check to look at the etymology of the word. And the word hero, according to the OED, is in classical mythology and ancient Greek history, a man, and it even says, or occasionally a woman, of superhuman strength, courage, or ability, favored by the gods, especially one regarded as semi-divine and immortal. Also in extended use, denoting similar figures in non-classical myths or legends. So here you have a very specific meaning of the word hero. Strength, courage, or ability, right? And I think what's interesting here is that it's easy to think about ability. It's sort of easy to measure it. It's also easy to think about strength. But courage is a sort of strangely amorphous concept. And I also started thinking a lot about the philosophical work of Susan Nyman. And she has a really interesting idea of the political situation, particularly in Europe, but she extends it to the United States, which is that it is much easier to be a victim in our society today, and it's been this way largely since the Second World War, than it is to be a hero. And what she argues is that identity politics creates a competitive victimhood. So that it's much easier to be somebody who is oppressed or who has been historically oppressed to take on the mantle of victim than it is to actually stand for something. Because in order to stand for something, you have to decide right, what it is you stand for. You actually have to make a decision. And the biggest problem with making a decision about what you stand for is that you might actually stand for something 
wrong, or that other people may think is wrong, or that history may prove to be wrong, right? Certainly in the historical circles and anthropological circles that I move in, the communism of people like Elena Lagodinova and Frank Thompson, just their adherence to that ideology overrides all considerations of their actions for many people because they were communists. And this is a very common zeitgeist, right? This is a common popular myth that we have in the United States, that no matter what somebody actually does, if they are a racist or a sexist or a communist or a what have you, name your religion or um, ethnicity or nationality for that matter, that it somehow overrides their actual actions in life. And so it's scary to be somebody who stands for something. And when I ask my students at Bowdoin College, what do they stand for, this is what I get most of the time. In fact, you know, when I've lectured, I've, I just spent a year, as I said, in Germany, lecturing to audiences of students across the continent. I've been in Poland, the Czech Republic, I was in Serbia, in Bulgaria, in Romania, in Germany, both former East and West. And you ask people between the age of 18 and 25, what do they stand for? And this is largely what you get. So that's interesting. First of all, why and what does it mean? And so I started, I've been thinking a lot about this, mostly because I feel moved when I read historical accounts about people who stood for things. We all do. In fact, much of our popular literature, much of our, um, our popular movies are about people who believe in something, who take a stand, right? And so why is it that we generally feel awash in a kind of apathetic morass in the early 21st century, late, late capitalism. What's going on? And is there a difference, right, between standing for something? What is the relationship between standing for something and happiness or life satisfaction? So there were a couple of studies that were done by some social psychologists. And they were interested in understanding the relationship between precisely happiness and having a meaningful life. And what they argue is that happiness and having a meaningful life are completely separate things. And one does not necessarily lead to the other. Now, in their survey, they found that nearly a quarter of an Americans do not have a strong sense of what it of what makes their lives meaningful. That's one out of four Americans. When you ask them, why are you alive? What are you living for? They don't know, right? And this includes, right? This includes, I live for my children, right? Um, now, you, you may say that maybe this is a, I'll come back to this in a second, but, but, but this, so this is even really local reasons for being alive. Like, I live because of my parents, I live because of my children, I live for my friends, I live for my partner. So, so a th one out of every four Americans doesn't know what they're living for. And so they did this really interesting study, right, called Some Key Differences Between a Happy Life and a Meaningful Life. And what they did was they looked at a, a large sample. This was a longitudinal sample. And again, this is a, a large N of people self-reported about their lives, whether they're happy, whether they're meaningful, and the characteristics of their lives. And what they found after doing this study was that people who reported the highest amounts of happiness, right, who said they were happy, when they broke down and standardized the characteristics that um, constituted happy people, they found that happy people generally tend to have a pretty easy life. They have good health. They have enough money to buy the things that they need. They tend to focus on the present and the short term. They have a very active um, social life, but not a very, so a lot of friends, but not very deep friends, right? So a lot of acquaintances, we might say. And they have very little stress and worry. But what's fascinating about the study that these social psychologists found is that these factors had no association with meaningfulness or had the opposite association. So people who reported that their lives had a very high level of meaning, that their lives felt very meaningful to them, interestingly, 
had more negative events in their lives. They reported, you know, uh, more health problems, more money problems, more difficulties, deaths of parents, spouses, children, so on and so forth. They also had a more focus on the long term, on the past and on the future. They tended to be much broader thinking than just focusing on the present moment. They tended to be more introspective. They also engaged in activities that they considered to be true to themselves. So they didn't do things just because other people thought they should do them. They tended to do things that they thought they wanted to do. Um, and they reported, as you could probably imagine, higher levels of stress, higher levels of anxiety and worry, right? So these were two very different types of people. And these characteristics correlated with two very different types of description of life. One, a happy life, the other, a meaningful life. And this actually <laughs> solved a fundamental mystery that social scientists have been dealing with for a while, which is that why people who have children report higher levels of unhappiness, right? So we know, for instance, that parents are generally unhappy, self-reported compared to non-parents. And yet, they report very high levels of having meaningful lives. The study concluded, happiness without meaning characterizes a relatively shallow, self-absorbed, or even selfish life in which things go well, needs and desires are easily satisfied, and difficult or taxing entanglements are avoided. And so you can imagine, if you are a parent or you have parents, right, that having kids is, is, is not a self, selfless, sorry, it is not a selfish act, right? <laughs> it requires a lot of, uh, I have a teenage daughter, I know. Um, it, it requires a lot of patience. It requires an incredible amount of effort and patience and, and, and um, you know, forethought is not, uh, it is definitely a taxing and difficult entanglement, as the study would say. And yet, why do people have children? You would think they would stop having children, they don't. It's because even though children may not bring immediate happiness, they bring very, very high levels of meaning. Interestingly, one of the authors of this study wrote an opinion piece in the Sunday New York Times about millennials, which I think many of you would consider yourselves millennials, people born after 1980. And what they argued is that, in fact, after the 2007-2008 financial crisis, millennials are starting to move away from valuing happiness and searching more for meaning. That this is a general, again, zeitgeist among the younger generation. And Victor Frankl, who uh, was a psychiatrist and a neurologist who watched much of his family, including his pregnant wife, killed in the concentration camps during World War II, wrote a really important book called Man's Search for Meaning, which was published in 1946. And in this book, he argued, being human always points and is directed to something or someone other than oneself, be it a meaning to fulfill or another human being to encounter. The more one forgets himself by giving himself to a cause to serve or another person to love, the more human he is. Now, I forgive all the male pronouns here because obviously it's 1946, but I think Viktor Frankl is getting at something which these social psychologists in 2013 have also put their finger on, right? Which is that people who report high levels of happiness do not necessarily report high levels of life satisfaction. That there's a, there's a huge disjuncture, which explains a lot about some of the general malaise and the high uh, antidepressive use of our society. Now, this is a slide that I put up when I originally wrote this talk. I said, today, real life heroes are out in the fashion sense because they might stand for something that turns out to be wrong or bad or dangerous, like communism in my case. We are also worried about what we stand for, that we forget the value of standing for something at all and focus instead on our immediate happiness. Now, I want you to think about the heroes that you thought about at the beginning of my talk. 
And I have to say, I've been challenged on this slide, and I'm happy during the question and answer period to take some more challenges. The vast majority of people that I ask generally tend to say a parent or a grandparent or a relative of some kind. Different national contexts, however, you find a really interesting variation. So when, for instance, when I was in Germany, I had several young German people come up to me and say that they thought that Edward Snowden was a hero. And I found that really interesting. And he certainly meets the, the criteria in terms of selfless action, whether, whatever you believe about his uh, politics. Um, and others have, have talked about contemporary, um, other contemporary political figures like Julian Assange or um, Bradley Chelsea Manning, so on and so forth. So, so the question is, maybe I'm wrong on this particular point. But I think in general, until very recently, and this may have to do with the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, there has generally tend to be a, um, a tendency for people to focus on happiness rather than to focus on meaning, rather than to focus on what you stand for, right? I think that Frank Thompson and Elena Lagodinova are my personal heroes not only because they stood for something, but because the things that they stood for are things that I still believe in and I want to believe in and I want more people to believe in, like social justice, peace, for instance, international cooperation, women's rights, racial and ethnic equality, building a better world. Now, on some level, these are just platitudes. These are things we talk about all the time. We're supposed to believe in these things. Some of us are, anyway. But, but to really believe in them, to really fight for them, what does that actually mean today? It means something very different, obviously, than it did in World War II. But these were young people. In the case of Elena, she was 14. In the case of Frank, he was 19, who truly found something to motivate their lives, to give their lives meaning. And uh, on the monument where Frank Thompson is buried in Bulgaria. There's a large obelisk, and it is a, a monument dedicated to all of the Bulgarians and others who fought against fascism during the First World War and the Second World War. And there's a poem by a Bulgarian poet called Nikola Vapsarov, and he writes, please tell our story simply to those we shall not see Tell those who shall replace us, we fought courageously. And this is what I tried to do when I wrote the book, Left Side of History. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, absolutely. Um, in order to make things go smoothly, I think you should just ask your question as loudly as you can, and then Kristen, if you would just summarize it for the microphone. Sure, no problem. OK. So could I ask the student questions first? Anybody want to tell me who their heroes are? Anybody have somebody that wasn't a relative? Yes, who? My boss. Your boss. Ah, very good. Okay. Any so so, but but somebody not related. That's great. Anybody else that was not a relative or related to you in some way? Nobody. Yes. JFK. JFK. Okay. So definitely right in that category. Anybody else? Why do you think that is? Yeah.
Right, and you know, I, I think you've put your finger on something really interesting, which is that heroes in our culture have to be infallible, right? What you're saying is that you can't be human and be a hero because we all have these bad, we all have these bad sides, right? And I think that that is, um, that's really politically expedient for people who don't want people to have heroes, right? Because, and, and, and certainly I deal with this all the time when I deal with my, my two, the characters in this book, right, who are two very important people. I mean, Frank Thompson basically died before he could really do anything horribly bad. He was only 23, right? So in some ways he was pure because he died. And so some people say in order to have a hero, it has to be dead. He has to be a dead hero, right? But, but still, we can go back and excavate things for, about people's pasts. But, um, I mean, and I think you're right, that there's a real risk that you might really admire somebody. I certainly, there are people living today that I admire greatly who I don't want to meet because I'm terribly afraid that they'll be jerks when I meet them and it will ruin my impression of them, right? I want them to be heroes. And when I do meet them and they turn out not to be jerks, I am so overwhelmed by that, right? It happened to me this summer. I, I met a, a, a hero of mine in person, and he turned out to be an absolutely lovely, wonderful human being. Not at all what I expected. So I think we have a, a kind of um, a, a, an interesting definition of hero, because if you are a victim, what you're saying is that it doesn't matter if you're purely a victim. Victims don't have to be perfect. Victims can be totally flawed. Right? And so why do, we give, why do we extend that courtesy to victims, but we don't extend that courtesy to people that we admire? We extend the courtesy to people we feel sorry for, but we don't extend the courtesy to people we admire. I think that's a really interesting contradiction. And we don't think about that very often. In fact, you know, I think that uh, I have a 14-year-old daughter, as I said, who is just forming a friend group. Um, and the politics of that friend group are clearly about competitive victimhood, right? People mobilizing certain identities in order to not feel as if they're part of a kind of majority oppressive culture. And I find that really interesting. Yes? Right, and I think that um, the, the nice thing about that study is that it, it, it factor, it controlled for things like age and gender and socioeconomic class. So what, we, what, what they found, right, is that the characteristics of people that make them happy, regardless of age, class, gender, religion, what so, so on, um, are the same compared to people who lived um, meaningful lives, right? So the, the thing is, is that you might actually be a kind of miserable person. You might actually feel sad. You might even be slightly depressed, right? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not living a meaningful life. In fact, it might actually mean that you're living a me very meaningful life. You know, one of the, so the other thing is, if, if, how many people are hockey fans? Anybody a hockey fan here? Okay, if you're a hockey fan, there is a documentary film that you absolutely must see. It's called Red Army, and it's about the Soviet Army team. Um, it is a great documentary. And, uh, and it's about the story, this young California documentary filmmaker went and interviewed the now still living captain of the Soviet army team from the 70s and the 80s. And it really is about the difficulties of his life. And, and now he's, he's currently the minister of sport in Russia. Um, but it, and it, is, you know, it ends on this note of he has a legacy now, right? He's been immortalized by this documentary film. And I think. It, it comes off as, yeah, I had a really tough life. I was born in the Soviet Union, and I lived through the 90s, or the Yeltsin era, all sorts of things. But in the end, I was true to my sport. I was true to myself. I'm true to this vision that I have of hockey being the most important thing. And, and there's a sense of real satisfaction there. It doesn't necessarily seem that he's a very happy guy. Right? <laughs> um, if any of you have seen the film, you know, a couple of times he's positively rude to the documentary filmmaker. But it's a really interesting reflection on why we value what we value in our lives. 
You know, the other thing is, um, right now in the United States, there's a kind of a popular tendency towards meditation. I don't know how many of you have mindfulness, you maybe have heard of this, where everybody is supposed to be sitting still and finding inner peace. And um, what's interesting about that is that the Buddhists precisely to t tell you that the most important thing is to focus on the present, right? And to let go of your attachments, and then you will find happiness and peace. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental core of Buddhist theology. And yet, what's fascinating here is that it's also in tension with Buddhist uh, admonition to have a purpose, right? So, so that um, what we know from these social psychological studies is that people who think really deeply about the world and the trouble that the world is in may not actually be very happy people. They may not have any inner peace, but they may actually do something to make the world a better place. Now, when you try to do something to make the world a better place, you might fail. And you might fail miserably. You also, I think I deal with this all the time when I give this talk in, in Europe, you run the risk of making the world a much worse place, right? So the people in the 30s who were passionately committed to the communist idea had no idea what Stalin was doing in the Soviet Union, had no idea what the Soviet Union was going to do with communism, right? The communism that came about, the really existing communism of the 20th century, was an awful distortion of the ideals of people like Frank Thompson and Elena Lagodinova. And some might argue, as some do, that without people like Frank Thompson and Elena Lagodinova, we never would have had that terrible distortion, right? But when I get that question, I often say, well, what about the people in the United States who are passionately committed to the ideal of democracy? Passionately committed to the idea of free markets. Are those ideas also not subject to their own distortions? And are those passionate people committed to those ideas in not responsible for the distortions of those ideas? And then it gets complicated, <laughs> right? Other questions? Yes. Right. And my hero was Winston Churchill, who was depressed, possibly alcoholic, <laughs> who spent the last 15 years of his life going uh, senile, yet perhaps was at the right place at the right time, very, very unique thing. And um, so that has faith involved right. in this. Uh, I also think um, about the happiness thing. Uh, there was a Baltimore Catechism question that said, why did God make me? God made me to know, love, and serve in this world and be happy in the next. Not here. You know, and that, that resonates in the end. Right. And then one other thing about defining a hero, there's another saying that I carry around the night. You never know the meaning of a story until it's over. And we're always in the middle. So we can't define our hero. We don't know how it's going to turn out. And when you look in the past, things often turn out miserably. But that was certainly nobody's intention. Right. Right, right, but, but I think that, that, but that's precisely, you know, the point of, of, of this book, particularly, um, and I have to say that the feedback that I've got on it, I was quite worried that I was going to be attacked for being too pro-communist, um, and so I very much hedged my bets to, to make sure that I was talking about sort of communist ideals and not necessarily the practice of communism in Eastern Europe during the 20th century. And the only, and I feel like people have been extremely sympathetic to that message. I mean, way more sympathetic than I ever imagined, to be honest. The only people who criticized me and did so in a half hour radio broadcast were the Stalinists who said that I was too hard on Joseph Stalin, right? Um, I couldn't believe that. First of all, I didn't even know there were still Stalinists out there. Um, they're in Canada, apparently. Um, but I also, I, I had no idea that this book would be stepping on the toes of people who consider Stalin a hero. I, <laughs> I had no idea that that, I mean, so I learned something really valuable in this, that everybody has their own way of viewing um, heroes or non-heroes, right? So there's an incredible amount of relativity here. My heroes may not be your heroes. 
you know, uh, heroes 100 years ago are not definitely not going to be the same heroes as 100 years from now, right? I mean, unless we talk, unless we move up from beyond the, the level of hero and we go back to that original Oxford English Dictionary definition, we think about people who are divine or immortal, right? We think about religious figures. That's a different category, right? And in some ways, to come back to the gentleman's point up here, the reason that religious figures are, uh, are available to us as heroes is because they are infallible. <laughs> they have been stripped of all those horrible negative things right, in some ways that make them, that would make them unqualified for heroism if they were contemporary living people among us today, right? So, but I also think that, you know, there's a sense in which people are hungry for ideals again in a way that they haven't been in the last 25 years. I think that the fall of communism in Eastern Europe created an ideological and idealistic vacuum for people who once had some kind of fantasy of actually making the world a better place in a very secular materialist way. And that suddenly the tides are starting to change in a way that I, I'm, I'm actually quite surprised is happening as fast as it is. I mean, just think about Bernie Sanders, right? Um, running for, running for um, president. Or, or the popularity of a book like Capital in the 21st Century by Thomas Piketty. I mean, it's really astounding that a 870-page Harvard University Press books, book was on the New York Times bestsellers list, right? What's going on? That's what I want to know. Yes? Right. Yeah, I mean, so, so there's a couple of things. So the, the migrant crisis has been going on um, for a long time. It's just hit the US media because of the sort of very sensationalist cases over the summer. Um, and one of the things that I very much dislike about the American media coverage of the migrant crisis is that there are, in fact, many Western Europeans on the ground, especially in Greece and Italy, who are desperately trying to help these migrants, right, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. And one of the things that doesn't get talked about is that in Greece in particular, given all of Greece's social economic problems, is that the vast majority of people who are on the side of the immigrants are either members of Syriza or the Greek Communist Party, right? The people who are opposed, and the New York Times just had an article either yesterday or this morning about, um, there was an op-ed piece about how the US media is talking about how racist East Europeans are, and then this um, New York Times person was saying that the Western Europeans are just as racist and talked about the rise of the National Front in France and um, the Nationalist Party in the Netherlands and all of these nationalist parties that are coming to the fore. Now, what's fascinating about that is everybody is focusing on the far right because, yeah, let's face it, the far right in Europe is scary. I know this very personally. It's really scary. Neo-Nazis scare me to death. They're really frightening people. Um, and when I was in Germany, there was Pegida, which is patriotic Europeans against the, uh, what is it, the Islamicization of the Occident. These were very, very ordinary Germans going out on the street every Monday in Dresden to protest Muslims, broadly speaking. But again, what we don't hear about are all the counter demonstrations that are being run by the German Die Linke Party, all the Greek Communist Party, the Italian Communist Party. When I was in, I was in Strasbourg um, in April, was it March or April, and there was a huge French Communist Party parade protesting to accept immigrants, right? Um, and so I think that there are many idealists 
right, in Europe right now. There are many people who are trying to fight the right fight. Now, your question was about the refugees themselves, right, about the migrants themselves. And that's a harder question to answer because, of course, the ones that are coming from Syria, and they're not all coming from Syria, but the ones that are coming from Syria are truly fleeing civil war, right? Their livelihoods are absolutely at risk. And so they don't have a choice. They have very few options, I think. Um, and again, under the terms of the Geneva Convention, the European Union has to let these people in. It is the only humane thing to do. The problem, of course, is that the refugee or migrant crisis from Syria has precipitated a wider migrant flow into Europe from countries that are not necessarily embroiled in a civil war. And that has been the, the confounding factor, I think. So I can give you a very specific case in Bulgaria that I know of, which is that there was a very small village, and Bulgaria, by the way, is the poorest country in the European Union, a very small village where a bunch of migrants came and tried to, there was a refugee camp, and they tried to register their children to um, go to the local Bulgarian school. And the principal of that school basically said they couldn't come because they didn't have translators for them. And the, they did have, here's the thing, Arabic translators. And um, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch report, you know, had this huge expose about how Bulgarians are so racist and how they're rejecting these immigrants. And of course, upon further investigation, they went down and they found that these were Afghani and Somali refugees. And what they needed in, in, in specifically were Pashtun translators. And there weren't any Pashtun translators. And they also weren't eligible for refugee status in the same way. And then, very quietly, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International retracted their report. Right? I don't think um, idealism factors into fleeing a country that is falling apart from civil war, to answer your question quite succinctly. I think that there's a lot more going on. Yeah. I do, however, think, and I don't, you, I, I'm, I'm surprised at how few Americans know about ISIS but do not know about Royava and what's happening in uh, Kobani, right? There is a, uh, a Kurdish People's Republic that has been established to fight ISIS. Um, and there is a lot of idealism around this place. And in fact, uh, a very well-known anthropologist named David Graeber wrote a column in The Guardian, I think about six or seven months ago, where he basically said that this is, that Royava is, the, uh, anal it is analogous to Spain during the 30s, that anybody who wants to fight the forces of fascism must take up arms and go and fight with the Kurds. Um, they're a radical egalitarian republic. They have women in the army. They have a completely egalitarian social structure, political structure. It's really, truly amazing. And again, we hear very little about that in the United States. So there is ideology in the region that's motivating people, um, but it's not motivating people to leave. It's certainly motivating a lot of Europeans to go, however, right? So we've heard about that. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, no. Would you be available for students to come back? Sure, absolutely.